Thank you all for uh, showing up. I know it's late in the week and everybody's getting maybe a little bit of fatigue, but uh, glad to have you here this morning for a talk that I, I hope will be of interest to uh, many of you, since many of you are in higher education, for better or worse, as we'll see. Uh, and uh, so, so maybe I can um, help you see what, what uh, is going on in higher education, a bigger picture. Some of you see maybe what's going on at your college or university, and some of you see what's going on with uh, a few of your friends. And, and um, I, I would say that, uh, true to the title of the, of the talk, that higher education really is in a crisis today, there are three crises that I'd like to focus on. Really, the first two are the ones that I'd like to spend the most time on. If we have time, I'd like to go through the third. But they are, uh, first, that college doesn't do what it advertises. Um, some of you may have figured this out already. Um, and for that matter, that's why some of you are here. It's because you are not getting the kind of thing that the Mises Institute is providing through its Mises University program. And uh, you, are, you are buying books and, and reading materials online and listening to podcasts that is, is educating yourself beyond what a college or university is, is, is doing with you. In fact, you, you may find yourself countering some of what can only be described as propaganda coming out of, out of uh, colleges and universities. And the second crisis I'd like to spend some time on here is the cost of college. We've seen a rise, at least in the United States, and I think in, in um, other developed countries as well, in the amount of government funding, or that is taxpayer funding, that's going to higher education. I gave a talk yesterday on medical care economics and the finance of medical care, and we see a very similar thing going on there, that the government has funneled more and more money into medical care and uh, uh, this, is, this has happened over some decades, and yet we see medical prices rising, and it, it doesn't seem that, that medical care is more affordable than it once was. Uh, I would say that higher education also is suffering an affordability crisis as well. People are finding themselves in massive amounts of student loan debt. Uh, we have uh, I've got a slide to give you the exact number, but I think it's about $1.6 trillion right now just in the United States in student loan debt. And defaults on student loans are a real problem. And so I think that's an important thing to discuss. And then finally, if we have time, um, I'd like to go through just briefly some of the problems with academic discourse today. Some of you have seen some of the stories, the politicized uh, uh, classrooms where if, if uh, and, and professors are sometimes running scared because they are worried about something that they might say in the classroom being misconstrued or this, this idea of academic freedom of being able to, to say what you believe is correct in the classroom. If, if that's not politically correct, then you may find yourself out of a job or at least persecuted um, uh, substantially because of what you have said in the classroom. This has afflicted both left and right. Uh, the uh, uh, professors who may have thought themselves uh, safely um, uh, safe from uh, criticism from the left may find that they're just not left enough and and they they have criticism from from all sides so I, I think that's a problem as well as if you if you look to a university as a place to freely discuss ideas then uh, what's happening when we find that certain ideas will be shut down uh, certain speakers will be deplatformed um, simply for voicing something that is that is different from what others believe should be should be permissible speech. So we'll talk about that if we have some time. So the first crisis I'd like to mention here is that college does not do what it advertises. It's 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 not um, providing what people expected college to provide. So let's think a little bit about what college does do. Does it transfer skills? I think that's the the uh, typical uh, perception that, that college is there to teach you something, that you're supposed to walk out uh, with your degree at the end of the four years or however long the program is, and you're supposed to have some more knowledge in your head than you had when you started. And therefore, 
be a, uh, a, a better rounded person or a person who has uh, more skills that are applicable in the workforce or whatever it is that you were seeking when you went in the door, you came out with more knowledge and you came out with a, a better uh, 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 understanding of the society around you than you had when you, when you went in. Or is it possible that college is simply a signal apparatus, that it's a way of um, communicating to a potential future employer that you are a person who works hard, you're a person who has the ability to think at a different level, uh, you're a person who can engage in a four-year-long project and complete that project. Is that what you're communicating when you get a degree? And there's been some recent work, and, um, most notably, I think, by Brian Kaplan, on that uh, idea. And then third, perhaps it's just a consumption good. I mean, we've all heard of party schools, but perhaps uh, colleges and universities in general are turning into a kind of a, a party environment for young people to sort of stretch out their, their, uh, uh, their dependency on their parents a little longer, maybe get some government subsidized fun out of the uh, experience. So that's certainly a possibility as well, that maybe if you've got enough money to go to college, then you enjoy that four years to sort of socialize, and you can maybe take some classes that seem like they might be uh, somewhat interesting to you, but not necessarily classes that would generate a, uh, a wider range of opportunities once you graduate. Now, we, we have seen that there is a connection between the amount of education a person receives and the income that that person will have um, uh, later in life. And maybe that's immediate, and maybe that takes some time to sort of manifest in a person's uh, income or, or uh, uh, their, their, their job uh, prospects. But what we see is that for the highest brackets of income here, $100,000 and up, it is... Um, it is much more likely that people in that income range will have a college degree than that you would be in that income range and not have a college degree. There are very, very few people, as you can see here, who are making this kind of income who have only a high school diploma. And so this is sort of the uh, uh, exhibit A for saying this is why you need to go to college. If you want to have a high income after you uh, by the time you're in your 30s or 40s, then you need to go to college in order to get that higher income. Uh, and so people with lower incomes on the left-hand end of the, of the uh, diagram here, interestingly, we see some people that have uh, college degrees that are in that low income category, and, and yet people who stop after high school and don't get any college education at all are much more likely to be in that income category. So uh, also you can see this is a chart from Richard Vedder's book, which I'll be referring to several points, at several points uh, today, a brand new book called Restoring the Promise, which I recommend. It's uh, um, uh, uh, Richard Vedder's um, been working in this area for a long time and, and has some uh, interesting things to say about the problems with higher education. So this is a chart from his, his book. Uh, and you can see here that, and this is divided by uh, male, female, and then median and mean. So let's just look at mean workers over 25, male, and you can see high school diploma, about $47,000. And then if you go to professional degree, uh, that'd be like a, a, a law degree or something, that would be about $161,000. People with a bachelor's degree, about eighty-five, eighty-four, eighty-five thousand. 85000 so um, it, it does look fairly clear from this that if you're over 25, um, you can expect, male or female, you can expect to see a, a pretty big income jump because of a four-year degree. So this is, um, this is what you would see from perhaps a high school guidance counselor or somebody who says, well, you need to go to college because, see, you can earn more money. Well, there's some problems with this. Vetter points out, for, for instance, that... Uh, one of the problems here is that this is aggregating the entire U.S. population. Over 25 includes people who are quite a bit older than 25 and who went through the higher education process back in the 50s or 60s. And these are individuals who um, may have uh, gone through their four-year program 
back before the sort of higher education bubble that we may be in the middle of today. Uh, they may have gone to college back when having a college degree really did set you apart from the general population in a significant way. Uh, but what about people who are just out of college? Is it possible that this group also would see this kind of, of, of major income uh, di disparity? That they, they would see a big jump in their income potential after completing four years of college. Uh, one more slide, sort of the guidance counselor type of slide here, and that's this one. You can see this is college compared to alternative investments. Again, looking at kind of an aggregate of all of the, the college graduates and what kind of rate of return did they get on their college investment. And so having an associate's or bachelor's degree has a pretty high rate of return compared to, say, the stock market or high-quality corporate bonds or gold or long-term T-bills or housing. So it, again, it looks like this is just a no-brainer. Of course, you should go to college. But again, it's not quite that simple. Here's another chart from Vetter's book. And Vetter is pointing out here that college education is actually not providing what we think it is for younger people particularly. This is the education requirement of occupations held by college graduates. Now, what we do see here is about half of, the, of, of college graduates are in a position that requires a college degree. OK? But then we see that over a third of college graduates are in a position that requires a high school diploma or less. A high school dropout could get that job, and yet we've got someone with a four-year degree in the job. Why is this? And then we've got people who, uh, about 11% here, who have more than a high school diploma but have less than a bachelor's degree, and yet they've got the full-blown four-year degree. So what's, what's happening here? And part of this is that you've got, let's say you've got a, a coffee shop, and you're, you own a coffee shop, and you're trying to hire workers, and you have a position for a barista in your coffee shop. And you have um, uh, 30 applica uh, applications for your barista position. And you think, well, how am I going to sort out the 30, uh, 30 uh, applications here? I've got to have some way to round file some of these and, and sort of cut out the chaff before I get to a, a top, top five or so. So what, what will I do? Well, an easy way to handle this is to just find whoever's got uh, the, uh, less education and, and formal education and drop, drop them from the applicant pool. So you say, well, OK, I've got 12 applicants here for this position who have college degrees. Uh, that usually indicates that they're pretty well-motivated people. They're, um, They'll, they'll be my first pick, and I'll just narrow the pool to those 12. And there's nothing about being a coffee uh, uh, mixer, barista, whatever, that requires a four-year college degree in sociology or something. So nevertheless, uh, that might end up being one of the margins on which the employer decides to uh, sort their, their uh, applicants. So we end up with uh, people who have four-year degrees that are working in jobs that very clearly don't need those degrees. And in fact, people may figure out that even if they want nothing more than a coffee barista level kind of job, their opportunities for getting such jobs are better if they have a college degree. And if government or other parties are subsidizing the attainment of that four-year degree, and if the four years that they spend in college is a fun time anyway, then why not spend a little extra time in college? Other people may be paying the bill. Uh, the, the experience is, is entertaining to some degree. So just enjoy your time and then go out and get a job that, yeah, maybe you didn't really need the knowledge you might have gained in college anyway before you got that job. So here's another chart from uh, Vetter. Uh, this, this is jobs requiring a college degree versus the number of college graduates. Note the significant disparity between the two, uh, two categories here. We've got jobs requiring a college degree, about 29 million of these jobs. And uh, then we've got about 42 million employed college graduates. So again, we've got people filling jobs that don't require that level of education. This, I thought, was one of the more interesting charts 
in his in his book, and I've uh, then we'll move on to some things from Brian Kaplan and others. But um, this is uh, from 1970 to 2010. Taxi drivers, shipping and receiving clerks, salesmen and sales clerks, firefighters, carpenters, and bank tellers, people that require, in order to do their job and do it very, very well, they may need only a high school diploma, or maybe less. Um, and yet, in, in the period of time, the four decades from 1970 to 2010, we've seen the percentage of taxi drivers and chauffeurs who have a... Um, a bachelor's degree or more, not a two-year degree, but a four-year degree, has soared from around 1% or 2% in 1970 to over 15% in 2010. Uh, salesmen and sales clerks from about 4 or 5% in 1970 to nearly a fourth of these individuals who have bachelor's degrees Today, is the, is the jo has the job changed in that amount of time that you really need to have that kind of education in order to do those jobs well? I'd suggest not. Uh, carpenters, firefighters, bank tellers, similar kinds of stories to tell there. So uh, we seem to be over-educating for the kinds of jobs that people um, are getting when they, when they graduate. Now, I mentioned the signaling hypothesis here. This um, predates Brian Kaplan's work, but, but he's got a recent book out on this uh, in which he sort of elaborates on this idea that uh, higher education is not so much the conveyance of knowledge as it is a sorting process, a filtering process. So uh, let's say you've got a population here, and you've got two kinds of people. You've got highly motivated, intelligent, hardworking kinds of people, and you've got people who are not so highly motivated, intelligent, or hardworking. And the blues here are the highly motivated, edu uh, uh, highly motivated, hardworking, intelligent, and the reds are the others. So if that's the general population, then maybe you have um, some of that population that ends up going to this filter we call college. And if the filter is doing what we expect the filter to do in a signaling, under the signaling hypothesis, then those who are not so highly motivated or intelligent or hardworking end up failing or dropping out, and they end up in this box here with people who are unmotivated, undisciplined, and unintelligent. And uh, you've got others who simply say, well, I'm not going to go to college at all. Maybe I'm hardworking, but I'm just going to go apply my hard work to some business that does not expect me to have a degree. And that puts them also in this box. They're uncertified, motivated, persevering, and intelligent people. Okay? And then the filter passes some people through, and these are certified, motivated, hardworking, intelligent people. All right, so that means if you've got a four-year degree, you have certified yourself and you've communicated something, signaled something to a potential employer that says, hey, I'm hardworking. How do you know I'm hardworking? Well, I did this four-year project here. And it may not matter whether I did this in, in electrical engineering or civil engineering or mathematics or physics, but any of those programs require someone to be persevering and hardworking. So there you have it. My GPA is 3.6 or something, and so therefore I, I have evidence that I'm that sort of person. Talk is cheap, but this four-year project sorts out those who are just saying that they're hardworking and those that are genuinely uh, of that nature. Well, what does government subsidization do to this kind of process? So when the government, especially after World War II, or, or I, I guess it was actually technically in 1944, right before the end of World War II when the GI Bill was passed, we had government subsidization entering higher education in a big way, and that's, that's continued. So now we have taxes being extracted from the population and used to subsidize those within the population who would like to go through this filtering process. The filters don't remain unchanged. If you're a college or university and you've got all this, you know, people suddenly coming to you with piles of money because they've been 
uh, made eligible for some kind of government subsidy or a Pell Grant or whatever, uh, then you're, if you're a college or a university, you're inclined to open your doors a little wider to make it more possible for these people who are offering, offering wads of money to you to, uh, to go through your filter process. And the incentives are, are there for, for you to, to accept more students. Uh, so um, then the filter may end up still failing uh, some students who end up in this box as before, but it probably passes more as well. It passes students who otherwise may not have made it through the process. And uh, Vetter also goes through some of this in, in some detail, that colleges have seen a, a change in their threshold for passing students, that they're willing to pass students through that previously would not have made it, wouldn't even made it to college in the first place, wouldn't have been accepted, and now they're not only accepted, but make it through, and perhaps make it through with a, what looks like a very good GPA. So we end up with people who are being certified as motivated, persevering, and intelligent who are, in fact, not. You see a couple of the red dots made it through the filter now because the college has effectively lowered its standards in order to collect more of this largesse uh, uh, from the taxpayer that's funneled through these various kinds of government programs. Brian Kaplan says, once workers have been ranked, giving everyone extra years of education is socially wasteful. Furthermore, since the status quo is supported by hundreds of billions of dollars of subsidies, we're probably underusing alternative certification methods like apprenticeships, testing, boot camps, and so on. Uh, I, I would, I would um, love to know, I, I don't actually have data on this, uh, how many of the graduates of Mises University put this on their resume and get a boost in their job opportunities because they've been certified as having gone through this kind of process, or uh, what, what happens if you um, uh, take the, the Mundle, I need my water. Moonlick, Moonlick, somebody say that. Moonlick. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. To, uh, apparently, apparently, it's easier for Lithuanian tongues, right? So, good. Uh, the test. Yes. So, <laughs> so yes. Yeah. So, I'd be interested to know if that, if that produces a measurable uh, boost to your opportunities after you, you take the, the test. And... Uh, and if that, if that is, is something that may grow in importance, people seeking out some alternative to higher education. Mundlicher, I still can't say it. <laughs> Mundlicher Prüfung. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. I'd said it before. I knew I could say it again. All right. Signaling explains, Kaplan says, why students are far more concerned about grades than actual learning. They want easy A's, not professors who teach a lot of job skills. Signaling explains also why cheating pays. A successful cheater profits by impersonating a good student. And signaling explains why students readily forget course material on the day after the final exam. I know that never happens to any of you, right? Once you've got the good signal on your transcript, you can usually safely forget whatever you've learned. So Kaplan's arguing that higher education has become kind of an arms race, that the, the thing is not so much how much knowledge you've collected, but whether you've collected more than the other guy, or at least have a signal that looks like you've collected more knowledge than the other guy. So um, if you've got more education, more formal years of schooling with a GPA that looks pretty good, if you've got that and the other person who's applying for the barista job does not, then that gives you a leg up in the job market. So uh, we get credential um, deflation if we were to switch to a system that, uh, that didn't have this level of government intervention. Right now we've got credential inflation. So what a bachelor's degree might once have gotten you in the job market, it now takes a master's degree to attain. Um, my, my grandfather on one side had an eighth grade education. He did quite well, lived a middle class, comfortable middle class existence, uh, raised a, a family um, 
and, and so forth in the <laughs> mid 20th century with a, uh, an eighth grade education. Um, today, that would be very, very difficult to do with an eighth grade education. Uh, the, the credential inflation is working against that uh, possibility. And perhaps you heard uh, Lou Rockwell last night mentioning Henry Hazlitt, who had, I think he said, a sixth grade education, and yet did very well and was able to educate himself in a way that put him on a level with those who had four-year college degrees and even doctoral degrees at the time. Kaplan says, there's little sign that education causes much enlightenment or civic understanding. Even at top schools, most students are intellectually and culturally apathetic, and most professors are uninspiring. And don't hear me as saying that this is all the fault of students not being smart enough or motivated enough, because it's also professors who have gotten uh, sucked into the same kind of system and are apathetic. I mean, there are all kinds of colleges and universities where the professors don't read the papers that students write, if the students are still writing papers at all. They're not reading the papers. It's, well, it's easier for me to just give an A. Student's not going to complain. I save myself 30 minutes. Uh, I'll just assign it an A, uh, this, the paper an A. Now, this kind of, this is fraud, if we're to be honest about it. It's fraud. And many, the students are going along with it. The administration is going along with it. The faculty are going along with it. It's fraud. And yet, this has become widespread. Jonathan Newman uh, wrote an article for Mises Wire, I think this is from a year or two ago, on uh, why college degrees are becoming useless. And he points out something that, that Vetter has also pointed out more recently, that graduates have little to no improvement in critical thinking skills. Uh, he says that some of the most prestigious flagship universities test results indicate the average graduate shows little or no improvement in critical thinking over four years. Employers are beginning to discount the degree signal as well. Google, for example, doesn't care if potential hires have a college degree. They look past academic credentials for other characteristics that predict job performance. At Yale College, where 62% of grades are in the A range, proposals to curb grade inflation are in doubt following student protests and faculty concern. Arthur Levine found in a national survey that 41% of students had grade point averages of A minus or higher in 2009 compared to just 7% in 1969. This is uh, from gradeinflation.com. It's uh, the change in four-year college grade distributions nationwide from 1940 to 2012. The red line there that you see that's, that's uh, gone up so much, that's A's. A's. Now about 40, well, now that's 2012. If the trend has continued, then it's probably close to half of the grades being assigned are A's. It's like, I don't know if you remember uh, the uh, Garrison Keillor's uh, radio show, and you probably don't, you're too young, but he had a radio show about this fictional town called Lake Wobegon where um, all the children are above average. And uh, uh, B's have dropped somewhat, but only because A's are rising faster. And again, this is, this is part of that fraud. I mean, I think professors are saying, well, I know the students aren't going to show up in my office and just complain, and they're not going to, they're not going to object if I give them an A. If, they, if, if I give them a B, then I've ruined their 4.0. Uh, you know, they've been in school for three years. They've collected all of these easy A's, and now I'm going to be the one to, I'm going to be the target of their wrath. And professors just don't want to deal with that. And uh, so they end up perpetuating this kind of, a problem. F's, by the way, that's the purple. F's have dropped to less than 5% of all grades assigned. This is again from Vetter's book. Um, so maybe people are getting more A's because they're working harder, right? They're learning more, spending more time studying. Uh, we have more intelligent students in the classroom in the first place, so they're just working hard and they earned those A's, right? No. 1961, 40 hours 
a week spent on academic work in colleges per student on average. By 2003, that had dropped to, what's that, about 27, 28 hours a week on academic work. So, uh, and, and I've seen this, and it's, it's, it's not just at, at my college, it's, uh, I think it's at many colleges where students are expecting to not have to work as hard to get an A. All right. Let's look at the next crisis. Government subsidies are backfiring. Now, I mentioned student loans, student debt. So that's the debt clock as of yesterday. Um, this is at uh, finaid.org. You can find the debt clock, but I'd kind of be curious as to how much has changed in 24 hours. But anyway, $1.6 trillion and uh, climbing. Uh, I gave this talk, um, or a similar talk last year, and I think it was under 1.5. And it was just, it seems like only about three or four years ago that it crossed a trillion dollars, so it's rising. Um, so according to Bloomberg, college tuition and fees have increased 1,120% since records began in 1978. The rate of increase in college costs has been four times faster than the increase in the consumer price index. Again, similar to medical care, we've seen rapid increases in the cost of medical care in the United States and uh, it's one of the more subsidized, regulated uh, industries in, in this country. Uh, so the CPI here, the Consumer Price Index, and uh, can I say Consumer Price Index without being? Uh, there, OK, all right. All right. <laughs> we understand, disclaimer here, we understand there are massive problems with trying to aggregate prices like this. And, Nevertheless, these are the statistics that I, that I was able to locate. The statisticians are not Austrian economists, so we make do with what, what's available. In any case, so here's the CPI uh, rising price <coughs> levels and uh, a, a rising cost of tuition. Now, some of this is... is, is misleading because colleges are engaging in more price discrimination than they once did. Now, price discrimination means you're charging students different prices for the same product. So some students are on a full scholarship, their price is zero. Some students are paying the full sticker price. And many students are paying something in between. So colleges have figured out that they can have a very high sticker price and then study a student's financial information, their household income and so forth, and then match the price to their ability to pay. Now, where do you, where, where you ask, do they get all of this private financial information? The free application for federal student aid, FAFSA, where the, uh, the income tax information, the income tax information from a household's uh, tax forms is cross-loaded onto this FAFSA form, and all of this information is made available to the universities so that they, they can then tailor the price according to your ability to pay. Now, this is not all bad. It sounds terrible, especially because we've got a negative connotation with the word discrimination, which I would argue this is very different from uh, the kind of the, the use of the word that we normally uh, would would uh, see the context we normally see that word used in. So uh, uh, price discrimination does have at least one salutary effect, which is that uh, students who are low income may have access to college that would not otherwise have had access to college. If everybody had to pay the sticker price, even if the sticker price is lower, you're going to exclude students from college that may otherwise have been able to attend. So um, this is the percentage of median household income required to go to college. And we can see here that college is requiring a larger and larger fraction of median household income. That is, college affordability is declining 
in the United States, even though government aid has increased. How can this be? Could it be because when the government uh, subsidizes college education, the colleges and universities say, well, they've got access to this much more money, we'll just raise our prices. And so colleges and universities have seen increases in, or have, have instituted increases in their tuition on a par with the access to federal and state dollars that students have. So this is not really improving affordability of college education when they can simply uh, uh, rake off that taxpayer money into the coffers of the college or university. Um, and, and there are all kinds of, of battles being fought within the administration. Who's going to get all of this extra money? Uh, student services, um, student medical clinics, and, and entertainment facilities, and athletic facilities for students have all exploded in size over several decades, uh, spending a lot of this money that's been, been taken in. Uh, it's not exactly going to student education primarily, but to these other things that make college education more of a consumer good. So students end up, in many cases, borrowing money to fund their education, and we find with, they find uh, themselves burdened with debt. Uh, this is a chart showing all kinds of debt and the delinquency rates on that debt. The, uh, the student loan line is the red here, which you can see. Big increase in in uh, delinquencies in about 2011, 2012, just a couple of years after the official end of the last recession in the United States, um, probably related to that. Um, if you look at other kinds of debt, here's credit card debt, big spike about the time of the last recession, and then a decline. But the highest delinquency rate now among all of these different kinds of debt is student loan debt. And the consequences of this for individuals are very serious. Um, so William Bennett, writing many years ago, said that increases in financial aid in recent years have enabled colleges and universities blithely to raise their tuitions. And so they have. Um, and there's a, a, there are a number of studies that indicate that this is exactly what colleges and universities have been doing. They say, oh, well, you've got more money, we're going to charge you more. And of course, the student doesn't really have, the more, have more money. They're simply uh, qualifying for these federal and state aid programs. Larry Single and Joe Stone in 2007 uh, write that um, the uh, uh, Bennett hypothesis was um, not supported for in-state tuition for public universities, but for private universities, increases in Pell Grants appear to be matched nearly one for one by increases in list and net tuition. Out-of-state tuition for public universities behaves very uh, much like private universities. That is one for one, approximately one for one increase, dollar for dollar. You increase your student aid by a dollar, the tuition goes up by a dollar. <coughs> Nicholas Turner, uh, Turner in 2012 said intended cost reductions of tax-based federal student aid are substantially offset by institutional price increases for a sample of four-year colleges and universities. Tax-based aid crowds out institutional aid roughly dollar for dollar. Uh, Cellini and Golden in 2013 Title IV institutions charge tuition that is about 78% higher than that charged by comparable institutions whose students cannot apply for federal financial aid. Luca, Nadald, and uh, Shin in 2017, uh, there's a pass-through effect of, on tuition of changes in subsidized loan maximums of about 60 cents on the dollar, smaller but positive effects for unsubsidized federal loans. Most pronounced for more expensive degrees, those from private institutions, and for two-year or vocational programs. I mean, the, the evidence for this is really stacking up. I won't go through uh, this one here. But again, if it's not dollar for dollar, it's pretty close that we're seeing this increased student aid offset so that the student is uh, perhaps burdening himself or herself with added debt but not... Um, not uh, uh, 
seeing as, as, as much of a benefit in the college degree itself. So where does the money go? As I said, there's a lot of infighting within administrations and other interests groups within colleges and universities as to who's going to get this largesse from the taxpayer. Dorms. Well, one egregious example here is Princeton University. Do we have anybody from Princeton here? No? Okay. Uh, spent $136 million on a student dorm with leaded glass windows and a cavernous oak dining hall. The dorm's cost approached $300,000 per bed. NYU has provided $90 million in loans, many of them zero interest and forgivable, which is sort of like a giveaway, to administrators and faculty to buy houses and summer homes on Fire Island and the Hamptons. Ohio's former Ohio State President Gordon Gee earned nearly $2 million in compensation last year while living, this is, would have been 2012, while living in a 9,600 square foot Tudor mansion. The Columbus Camelot includes $673,000 in art decor and a $532 shower curtain in a guest bathroom. <laughs> Ohio State also paid roughly $23,000 per month for Mr. Gee's soirees and half a million for him to travel the country on a private jet. University of California, about 2,400 administrative staff just in the president's <laughs> office of the University of California. Richard Vetter says 30% of the adult population has college degrees, but as we've seen, this doesn't mean that this is where, th this is improving the outcomes for these students upon graduation. So the money is being soaked up by these administrative uh, salaries and by these uh, dorms and the, the other lavish facilities for students, improving perhaps the consumption value of a college degree, but not notably improving the outcomes for students upon graduation. So Vetter argues that in, in housing, we had all these low interest rates created by the Federal Reserve. Uh, the government encouraged people to buy a house, even if their credit wasn't so good. We're doing the same kind of thing with student loans. We're encouraging people to go to school who don't really have good qualifications, who might be better off in some occupation that doesn't require a, a, a college degree. And so Vetter suggests the best thing for us to do is to disinvest or, or get government out of a college education, stop this kind of arms race in degrees. Just a couple of minutes that I have left, I wanted to mention uh, for-profit education. This was hammered by the Clinton, I mean, uh, the Obama administration recently with uh, arguments that for-profit institutions are um, taking advantage of students by encouraging them to get student loans and then giving them degrees that are, that are uh, of dubious value. Um, but uh, I think the problem is much larger than for-profit education. And in fact, this is nothing new. We've seen for-profit institutions lately, but they've been around. Before, In fact, in 1897, more than 92% of college students were enrolled at for-profit institutions. The default rates for uh, uh, those at for-profit institutions or after graduating from for-profit institutions seem to be higher. But the kinds of students that are going to these institutions are probably different than those who are going to the traditional not-for-profit institution. That is, they may be more likely to have credit problems to begin with than students who go to not-for-profit institutions. So it's not at all clear that it's the fault of the institution itself. There have been a couple of cases, maybe more than a couple, of cases where uh, the for-profit institution is engaged in a kind of fraud. But as I've indicated, I, I don't think that that's, that's unique to uh, for-profit institutions. And the target, the, the uh, target for these for-profit institutions is students who might otherwise not go to college at all. Um, so uh, as A.G. Smith pointed out in his um, article, The Bubble in For-Profit Schooling, which is available on Mises.org, he says, as expected, many have ignorantly aimed their weaponry at the, at the profit motive instead of unleashing their fury on the root cause, government interference in the market. 
Uh, let's see, I'm going to have to skip one or two things here. This is kind of entertaining. Anyway, uh, I've, I have been teaching in higher education for 22 years. Um, my first classes that I taught were here when I was a graduate student teaching assistant at Auburn. And um, I've taught at mostly at private uh, uh, institutions. I'm, I'm now at a small uh, private college in South Carolina. And uh, I've seen the development. I haven't done a lot of research myself on higher education, but I've, done, I've been in the classroom for a long time. And I've seen the changes in higher education. It's not encouraging. I, I hope you won't see what I'm, hear what I'm saying here as a discouragement to not go to college, although that may be the, the, the best route for some individuals. I'm not, um, I'm not suggesting that it's a bad idea to go to college. Many of you are in programs, and I think that's, that's probably a good move for many of you. I hope that... Um, you will uh, get your formal education and you will begin to make contributions to the kind of scholarship that the Mises Institute is trying to encourage and, and sponsor. Uh, the programs like this will be an important part of your education even though your college or university may not recognize it or encourage it. I think this kind of thing is really vital to um, giving people the education they need. It's, it's outside of the mainstream. It encourages a breadth of thought that you may not get in the, in the classroom in a typical college or university. So I'll just close by saying I'm really happy that you're here. I think you're doing the right thing. If you're interested in talking to me later on about your uh, higher education prospects or a decision you're trying to make, I can't promise that I've got the, the answer for you, but I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll try to help you. Um, make a more informed decision. So thank you very much.